Welcome back to Rugged Made. I'm Jared. And I'm Jake from Dude Ranch DIY. So we're down here visiting Jake again. We had a great visit recently when Jake came up and visited us up in Boston. And we thought it'd be great to come down here and visit you again before the snow flies. Yeah, welcome back to the Dude Ranch. Yeah, well I see that you've made a lot of progress on the wood lot. Uh, Jake's been working hard. I hope you've been watching his videos. Uh, we got some interesting stuff planned for this visit. What do we have? Yeah, so for today, uh, we're gonna start out with uh, doing a little tree removal. I'm gonna strap up the spikes and throw on the climbing harness and uh, spike up the tree, get it down, and hopefully that'll allow some more sun to my parking area over there where I keep the dump trailer and a little solar panel trickle charger. All right, well, let's go watch Jake. He's, uh, he's a pro at doing this tree work, so we're gonna get some great footage of that, and uh, let's go get started. All right, hope you're ready to drag some brush. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us a little more about what we're gonna be doing today. So today the goal is um, to get this, it's a black birch tree, and as you can see here, it's right on the edge of the driveway, um, kind of leads back into the wood yard road. Um, typically in the fall, both for leaves and in the winter for snow, this is where I put a lot of the leaves in the snow. Okay. Um, also, as you can see behind us, I have my dump trailer parked back there, and I have a solar panel that I use to keep, you know, a trickle charger to keep the battery charged up. Um, so in the summer and springtime when there's leaves on the trees, it blocks a lot of the sun that gets back there. So it's been an ongoing process. I've already taken down three trees in this area and I'd like to get these last three down. So I figured this black birch is perfect size for the six way wedge. I think it would make some really nice firewood. And uh, while I have the help here today with you on the ground, figured we could climb up it and uh, get her on the ground. All right, well, the woodlot's really coming along. I think last time we were here, wasn't there a massive boulder Yes, was there like was a, a massive boulder. It was now, a narrow choke point here. Yeah, now it's right there. We got it out, and uh, that puppy stands about eight foot tall when it was fully out of the ground. Um, the excavator could barely move it, but uh, we, we managed to get it out of the way. Yeah, well, it looks really good. It's nice, nice wide access, and I, I see why this tree is maybe one of the last things still kind of sticking into the into the road in the way of your trailer, in the way of plowing, and uh, I guess, yeah, blocking light. So Exactly. So you're going to be climbing this thing today, right? I am. So how did you learn how to do that? Um, well, I, climbing was always kind of a thing that I wanted to do. Ever since I was a little kid, my parents had people come and trim the trees and stuff, and I just thought it was amazing watching the guys up there. So it was something always kind of on my bucket list, and then when I was told that I had no choice but to go to college, I figured I would choose something that I was actually interested in, so I went to school for forestry. All right. uh, in high school, I, I worked for a, a tree care company just doing ground stuff. Um, and when I went to college and graduated, I, I started out working for a pretty large, well-known uh, tree care company on the more residential side of things and really got my you know, bearings as far as climbing goes and, and stuff like that and then continued on, got my arborist license, got my international arborist license and now I've been doing tree work professionally for about 10 years. Um, I've been climbing for about eight of those 10 years and it's something that I really love, you know, keeps me young, keeps me fit and uh, it's not something that you see people do every day that's for sure yeah well that's why it's such a great opportunity to come down and talk to you about this stuff because I mean there are plenty of people who are doing this kind of work and you know some of them really know their stuff but I think it's it's great that you have that both the practical experience and that education background which you know truly makes you a pro um, I see we got some cool gear here so oh, yeah Tell us a little more about what kind of gear a pro like you uses when you're going to go up in a tree like this. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, one of the first questions I always get from a homeowner, somebody walking by on the street, how'd you get your rope up there? So, um, it's actually pretty simple, but this is a throw ball bag or a throw cube. And as you can see, it's nice and compact, but uh, it's pretty easy. And it unfolds just like that. And what it basically is, is like a you know, a, a weight bag. They, like some lead shot in there or something? Yep, lead shot, and it comes all different weights. You know, people have different preferences on, on how heavy or light they want to throw it. And then this narrow string. Now this string, don't let it fool you. It, it's, it's small, but it is very strong. Like, you could pull over a whole tree with this thing. Um, and I have about 250 foot of it. And then on the other side, there is another throw ball. Yep. Um, so you can work from both ends and basically you, you'll see me in a little bit, but you throw it up into the tree, have this come down and then you tie on your main climbing line, which is in this blue bag here. And that's how you pull up your climbing rope. Um, you don't just take the climbing rope and throw it up. It's much too heavy. So that uh, is kind of where, where the process starts. 
So um, uh, the technique for that, we're going to see it, but it doesn't. It sounds like it's not like a baseball. Pitch you're not kind throwing of. it like a baseball. No, it, you're actually doing it underhand, more like a granny shot in basketball. All right. Um, and again, there's different ways to do it. Uh, you can do it one-handed. You can do it two-handed. There's slingshots that guys use for really tall trees. Nice. There's air cannons, and now even people are starting to use drones to set these things in really big, tall trees. Um, so there's all different ways. I'm pretty conventional, you know, doing it underhand with, with two hands. That's the, how I personally like to do it. So, um, and then that brings me to the climbing rope, which is here in this blue bag. Um, the rope is very important. Obviously, it's your main safety, so I like to keep it in its own bag. And, uh, you know, there's all different styles of rope. This, this one's actually pretty old. It, it's definitely used, but it's still in really good shape. Have a carabiner on one end with a spliced eye. Um, you don't have to have a spliced eye. So this is uh, self-locking? Yep. It's got that uh, spring there. Double locking, carabiner, climbing carabiner, um, all aluminum. Okay. Um, now, is gear like this pretty common between this kind of professional tree climbing and, say, rock climbing? Um, yes and no. I mean, it's similar carabiners. These are specifically, like, for tree climbing. Okay. Um, you know, they're rated generally a little bit heavier um, because you're carrying more gear. All right. And, you know, there's a so load associated with it. Boots and stuff that a rock climber wouldn't have. Right. And just because of the nature of the work, rock climbing is more, you know, recreational, whereas this is, you know, industrial kind of like commercial setting. So okay. generally, I mean, there's, they make all different style sizes, weight capacities and stuff, but, um, this is, you know, my life. So I, I, I trust this stuff and buy the heavier duty ones. Yep. Um, and then, you know, it's basically, this is a 150 foot rope. I keep it all in the bag here. Um, and then that brings me to my actual climbing saddle, which again, there's uh, many different styles, types, stuff like that. But this is what would, I guess, be referred to as like an, an open leg. It's more like a rock climbing saddle. Mm -hmm. They do make some where instead of having loopholes for the legs, it's just a bar with a seat. So those could be a little bit more comfortable. Generally, you start out with that as more of a beginner climber, and then you advance to this. Mm. Um, this is called your bridge. So this is where you actually attach yourself to your climbing rope. Um, and this is a floating bridge. So as you can see, this floats back and forth, swivels 360, three different points of attachment there. Yeah, that swivel's pretty cool. So is this to reduce the tangling and twisting of the rope? Right. Minimize that. Um, friction is the name of the game here, both to keep you in the air, but you also want to minimize your friction because uh, it just makes it easier for you to ascend. Um, now that, that bridge, that sliding, is that to give you, you know, the ability just, to maybe, yep. you're wielding a chainsaw wire up there a lot of times. More maneuverability, yep. So um, when again, when you first start out, you can have a, a D-ring, which is kind of like this, mm -hmm. but there would be two D-rings like almost attached here and then you're fixed in so you don't have that maneuverability to you know slide back and forth um, which is kind of a little bit more advanced but you know again all different styles of, of saddles and stuff it's just down to personal preference um, I, I really like this one because it allows you more maneuverability then your other thing is your buck strap or positioning lanyard. You always want two points of attachment to the tree, especially whenever you're you know, using the saw actively. Um, so this is, I think it's like 22 foot long. And this is what you see guys when they're climbing poles and stuff, they throw it around and kind of flip it up. Um, and this just helps you, you know, position yourself properly ergonomically so that you can make the cuts and uh, you know be as safe as possible up in the tree. Now this tree isn't particularly large in diameter would that would you still be using that around a, a much bigger diameter tree? Oh yeah yep you use it basically on any tree you'd be ascending you'll see once I throw on the spikes and head up um, I'll have my climbing line set as a backup but basically to get up the tree you use this and you can just walk right up. Um, All right. So then you have your chainsaw lanyard. So this is where my chainsaw physically attaches to. Again, two points of contact. So you have it tied off here with this small little ring and then here to kind of shorten, shorten your lanyard when you're not actively using it. Um, let's see what else. We got a foot ascender, which you can actually put this on your, your, your boot 
typically use more when you're pruning trees or if you know your your point of attachment is out far and you're not right by the trunk to use the trunk to, to go up. You can put this on your boot and you can use your feet in addition to your arms to ascend up into the tree. And again, they make all different styles um, of these. And then the last thing would be just your handsaw. Always gotta have a handsaw. These are crazy sharp. People are always amazed with, with how big of a diameter stuff you can cut in the time you can cut it. Um, but these always are good to have, get you out of a jam, be able to you know, grab a rope if somebody's flipping you a rope um, and just make things more comfortable if there's a branch poking you in the neck. <laughs> so they're not worth breaking out the saw for. Right, exactly. Or just you know, little pruning and stuff like that, more delicate stuff um, where the chainsaw isn't really warranted. All right. So that's basically it. And then we got my climbing spikes here. And, yeah, and I think this is, this is part of the part of the work that I think people really love to see uh, uh, pros like you do is just you know, shimmy up that tree with spikes. Right. So everybody kind of knows about the spikes or gaffs sometimes people call them. Um, but again, all different types, all different styles. Um, these work for me. I haven't felt the need to upgrade them or anything. Um, but basically they're, they're both the same, just mirror images. So I got little covers on the spike itself. And uh, yeah, that's your spike. It. So you, don't, you actually don't want the spikes super, super sharp because mm -hmm. then they go into the tree too far and it ends up being hard to pull it back out to take your next step. But use two of those and it's kind of like a rooster having its spikes. <laughs> yeah, all right, those are cool, so. Yeah. Now has this tech changed much? Um, I mean, the, the yeah, they're doing this for a hundred years, right? I mean, I think they started out, they were like heavy steel and now they have them aluminum and titanium and carbon fiber and stuff like that. Um, a lot of the newer ones have, uh, like Velcro to make it more comfortable instead of these old leather straps. Mm -hmm. But, um, so I like it keep, keep it simple, you know? <laughs> so these work for me and, uh, you know, you'll see. I'll get up that tree, no problem. <laughs> all right, so thanks for the intro to the gear. I mean, this looks like really cool stuff. I think a lot of us get a kick out of all the, uh, the accoutrement, the, the, the tools and right. the gear that goes with the work. Uh, but now I think it's time to put it into use. So how do we start? Uh, well, I'll just saddle up and I can get the, well, first we'll start, I'll show how I do the throw ball and get that set up into the tree. And then I'll saddle up, spike up, and then uh, start climbing up the tree. All right, so you're going to use the throw ball now. Uh, about how high would you say that is? Uh, I don't know, like 45 foot. All right. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to use the throw ball. This is a heavier one. I just prefer a heavier one. I think this is like 16 ounce. And the way that I like to throw it is you take the string, and you see this ring here. I loop it through. So then you kind of hold it like that, so it's doubled over you know, on one hand and a single line in the other. And I go, I throw it like this, personally. And uh, then what that allows you to do is that when you let go with this right side, it kind of slingshots it and gives it like a little extra oomph, <laughs> so to speak. So we went a little high on that one, but might be able to make it work. We've got Mike behind the camera, and he's a big baseball fan. I think we were hoping for more of a, you know, a pitch kind of technique, yeah. but it seems like this works better. So then you just gotta... So this is called isolating it. Basically, you don't want your rope around any branches, because then those branches are gonna be in the way of, of you ascending up. Mm -hmm. So you kind of want it all on one side, and now I have this side of the throw ball on this side of my crotch, mm -hmm. and I'm hoping that I can pull all the slack out and use this throw ball on this side to get up and over onto the other side of the crotch. Okay, so, so there's an alternative to just throw after throw, try to get it perfect? Right, because it, you know, it's pretty hard to do it perfect every time, and with a tree like this with so many branches, sometimes you just gotta finagle it a little bit. So here we'll pull the slack out. Now is this the main reason there, that there's a ball on each end? Pretty much. 
because you have to flip it a lot of the time and isolate your climbing line, as we call it. So as we get to the top here, there's no big movements in doing this. It's all pretty light. And there we go. So we are over and now we just need that puppy to drop down. So this happens sometimes too where it doesn't want to come back down. <laughs> Looks like there's definitely some finesse and technique required to make this work. A little bit. Now, is this where you'd want the, this line to be as slippery as possible? Um, yes, slippery, but it's also because it's, I think it's in a tight crotch right mm. now. So, might need the carabiner for this. So we got it out, but we pulled it out of our crotch, so we'll have to give it another shot. The sun in my eye is definitely a factor here. <laughs> Well, you're supposed to be a pro. We're working to make this easy oh, for yeah, you. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> there we go. That looks like you nailed it. I think we nailed it. Oh, yep, yeah. That's, right in the crotch. That's our crotch. Yeah. Only took two tries. I think we'll call that a win. <laughs> okay. Very nice. I think we are good. Now I'm just going to isolate it from this side. side of that branch. This looks like you're fly fishing. Yeah. Oh, nice. There we go. Very cool technique. So, now we got this set. Oh, you know what? Actually, I can get this ball to come over yeah. that branch. This so is why you got two. <laughs> so when you say isolate, are you trying to get it just on the strong branch that's going to be supporting yeah, you? Yeah, you, you just want it around your, ideally around your one crotch. So see this last branch that's coming out? Mm -hmm. um, that branch as I come up would basically be in the middle of both of my ends of rope. So I would either have to cut it off before I could ascend over it or reset my rope um, to, to avoid it. So by doing this, now both ends are just around that one singular crotch. So we can take climbing line and because we have already found out that it's kind of a tight crotch, we're gonna take the carabiner off and basically here all it does to attach it, it's a, uh, it's a bowlin that you tie on here then you use a girth hitch to attach it to the Throw ball itself, so it's nice and quick and easy. So that's off. All right. Throw ball's off. Now we're going to use the girth hitch again to attach our climbing line. So we have a girth hitch there. And then we'll just do a couple half hitches to keep it nice and tight. Now, the, is the idea to make this kind of a small diameter so it yes. doesn't get hung up? Small diameter so that it doesn't get hung up on branches. So as you can see there, it's pulling it like basically right from the end. Okay. I can even slide this up a little bit. So it's grabbing it right at the end there, four points of attachment. Because if that gets hung up up there, that's a bad day, right? <laughs> right. You, can, you always have this end to pull it back down, but friction's the name of the game again. right back and wow look at that perfect so here's my climbing system so we'll take the throw line off put the carabiner back on now we're ready to climb so this is basically the climbing system 
This is the carabiner that attaches back to my saddle. This is a micro pulley. And this is called an eye to eye. So the eye to eye is what provides the friction on the rope to hold me up in the air. You tend your slack this way. That micro pulley helps reduce, again, more friction. That way it's easier to pull. And, you know, it holds it nice and tight, just rope on rope. So I can throw on the spikes and saddle and get up in the tree. Okay, see it. Safety first. It's good to have you back down on the ground. It's good to be back on earth. So when you're up there taking out some of these limbs, I noticed uh, there was some technique to how you were cutting them. It looked like there were two cuts for each one. Yeah, so when I'm up there and you know you have limbs coming off that are horizontal or you know somewhat inverted a little bit, um, I like to do a cut called the snap cut, which is you make a, a small undercut, just you know the width of the bar. You cut about a third of the way through to halfway through, depending on the size of the limb. And then you make another cut on top of that, a little bit in front or behind, depending on the scenario. And basically what happens is that instead of just cutting from the top and the branch kind of peeling down, um, when, when you're making that top cut with the bottom cut, uh, it, it releases on the top, so to speak, and then it comes down. And as soon as that bottom cut closes, it kind of snaps, hmm. hence the name snap cut. And the branch tends to lay down or fall more uh, you know, flat as opposed to coming down tips first 
or butt first. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the time it creates less damage to the property because you don't have a bunch of, you know, punji holes as we call them with the butts coming down into the grass or, the, you know, the driveway or something like that. Um, the other cut is, you know, just your typical, you know, box here. So this was one of the tops that I took and it was positioned on the tree like this. Um, so I came in with my bottom just flat at, you know, 90 or straight. Then you come in at a slight angle, like a 45, and you make your directional wedge or box. And then you come in from the back with your back cut. And all of this wood here is your holding wood. So in this scenario, I wanted to steer the branch a little bit to the right to avoid hitting into this oak tree here. So I left more holding wood, as you can see, mm -hmm. on the right there and cut more on the left. That way it would hold and kind of pull the top over to the right more. Um, so Well, it didn't land on me, so obviously it landed where you wanted it to. Yeah, we got it to go, you know, where we wanted, and uh, that's the name of the game. So you can, you can steer the tree if you know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, which he does. So now we've got the, these limbs to clean up. Let's uh, get the chipper fired up and get this mess out of here and then get to the last step. All right, sounds good. So what's next? So now we're going to drop the stick here, uh, the remaining part of the tree. So this is my climbing line, the red, and this is our pull line, the yellow. Uh, you never want to pull over a tree or like potentially shock your climbing rope for obvious reasons. So um, to get the yellow rope up to the same spot where the red rope is, I'm going to tie a sheet bend, it's called. So you make a, a loop like that, take your other rope, go up through, around the back, and back down. So that's a sheep bend. So now I can pull on the red rope. Oh, might be a tight crotch. Let me give it a whack. Yeah, give it a flip. Ready? One, two, three. Nope. Oh, but I got it around this thing. Let me see. Here, can you pull on the red? Yep. I'm gonna flip this, ready? Yep. Now, there we go. Okay. Got a tight crotch up there. Yeah. Been jamming us up all day. Yeah. So now we got it back down on the ground. Just loosen this up. Get our red rope out of here, we're done with that. Now we're gonna tie what's called a running bowling, and this is a knot that you can cinch down from the ground. Make a loop. It's just like a regular bowling. Might recognize that knot, but there's a loop mm. and it's running. So I can pull on this side. And it goes all the way up. So now we're set. I can take my rope here all the way back to the tractor. Okay, so now we're at the other end of the rope. We're gonna attach it to the grapple of the tractor. To do that, we're gonna tie a bowling on a bite. So you take your rope double it over and essentially just tying a bowl in on itself. So what this does, this is great for if you're just, if you have two guys and you want to pull, it's like two handles. But in this case, we're just gonna loop it up over the grapple and around the tooth. Now we're ready to go. Rope's pretty taut, back up the trackle, tractor, I'll make my box and then uh, we'll have this tree down in a jiffy right where you want it. Okay, so let's get this puppy on the ground.
good? Well, Jake, thanks for showing us how a pro takes down a tree. Absolutely, this was fun. Yeah, well, some of the things that I found interesting might even seem like the more mundane aspects of this, like like to think about the throw ball, this little $30 tool. Yeah, you know, it's the little things. You, you have the right tools and it makes the job a whole lot easier. Yeah, I mean, a lot of time we want to talk about, you know, the, the sexy expensive chainsaw and the tractors and the chipper and all that cool gear, but just a little, seeing how a little device like that gets your rope up there. Right, that's what starts the whole process, you know. And then at the end there, seeing you use the green rope to pull the tree down and all those knots, it, it really uh, dawned on me how this kind of tree work ties in things like, I, I know you boat. Ties with, in. <laughs> yes, knots, ties. Uh, but like, I know you do boating with your dad. Um, you've done some rock climbing, all those knots, the harness. It's interesting how it brings together uh, these other worlds that a lot of us who you know, might you know, split firewood and, and heat our homes with wood, um, but we also might like boating. Maybe we do some rock climbing. I mean, it just brings so much together. Oh yeah, you know, the knots are huge. Um, I'm a knot nerd. I, I find them really interesting. And you know, there's, doing tree work, you use all different types of knots all day. So you gotta be good with that. But uh, you know, they, they help tremendously just, just like the throw ball does. Yeah, I mean, at some point there's only so much that the new fancy tech can do. You gotta know knots, you gotta know your ropes and, uh, and you bring the tree down and then uh, we'll, What's next for us? So next, I mean, I think we'll run down the, the log here with the Mingo marker and mark it out to 16 inch sections. Then we'll cut those sections into like log length, maybe eight to 10 foot, haul them back to the wood yard. And then we could get, you know, fire up the, the rugged made splitter and, and split it all up into firewood. All right, well, we're gonna wrap it up here, but stay tuned for the next installment where we're gonna be doing the, the bucking and processing some firewood. Yeah, can't wait. All right, well, thanks for having us down here, Jake. All right, well, thanks for coming, Jared. See you in the next one. All right, see you guys. Oh, 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 oh